So today, we're going to talk about a very dangerous philosopher. A libertine who did not want to abide by society's rules. A man who sought and preached empowerment and saw himself as dynamite. That's right, we're going to be talking about the original idol of dark academia, Friedrich Nietzsche. But unfortunately, he's not some sort of fun, dark academic like George Bataille with his headless anti-fascist religion, that's a story for another time, but more of a philosophical edgelord, using his poetic darkness to mask some truly unpleasant ideas, and in some ways is not so different from many similar edgy types today. Many may lord Nietzsche as a philosophical titan of great significance, and lord his mythical assault on Christianity and radical project of transvaluating our society to overcome restrictive values. But all too often, what underlies these ideas for Nietzsche is a much less liberating philosophy than one may first think. Well, at least for most people. What is often not considered is the character of this overcoming. What is this liberation aiming for? And of course, the cost of this liberation. Who is excluded? And what happens to them? Nietzsche portrays himself as a radical outsider, as a sort of poetic vagabond come to shake up our outdated societies. But all of this is just an illusion. It's just a trick. And in the cold light of day, it may not seem as impressive an illusion as it once did. And it's in looking through this Nietzschean illusion that I think we discover. So, as YouTuber Curio recently pointed out in an excellent video, Friedrich Nietzsche is the go-to philosopher for edgy, would-be intellectual guys who want to show off that they have read some philosophy, and he is certainly a go-to throughout reference for movies who want to name-drop a dead philosopher as well. In which book did Nietzsche claim that almost all higher culture is based on cruelty? He who would learn to fly one day must first learn to stand and walk. One cannot fly into flying. That is not mine, that is Nietzsche's. Most of the guys who work here don't go around quoting Nietzsche. You know what Nietzsche said about them? He said they were God's second blunder. Bye, sis! Wait. Blessed are the forgetful, for they get the better even of their blunders. That's Nietzsche. Like the man said, what doesn't kill me just makes me stronger. That's Nietzsche, right? Yeah. Friedrich Nietzsche. Next. Shakespeare, Nietzsche, Frost, O'Connor, Kant, Pope, Locke. That's great, they're all dead. But of course, even though there are some bland, edgy readings of Nietzsche, surely such an eminent philosopher has some things of good to teach us, right? Well... Yeah? Before I start, I guess I have to say there are some good things in Nietzsche. Genealogy is a great technique and is picked up and used very well by later thinkers, and many thinkers' interpretations of Nietzsche have created interesting and useful philosophies. He has been referenced and used by excellent thinkers, from Emma Goldman to the French post-structuralists like Foucault, Derrida, and Deleuze. But at the core of Nietzsche, I think, is something quite dark, which is, today, perhaps too little commented upon, and one which I think illuminates some dangerous tendencies, not only in Nietzsche's time, but in ours as well. I also want to give credit to a book which was highly influential in making this video, The Overman in the Marketplace, by Ishe Lander which covers many of the arguments I will make here in much greater detail, and has loads of other stuff in it too, so I recommend giving it a read if you're interested in this. As some of you may notice, this is the same author I used as a core source in my Dark Side of Liberalism series, and yeah, I think he does good work, and I think it's worth sharing. But actually, that series does somewhat complement this piece, and if you haven't watched it yet, I do recommend checking it out. When I was taught Nietzsche at university, and first properly read his work, I got the sense of this ephemeral philosophy, with multiple interesting centres, but whose links were unclear. Even stranger, 
When in my A-levels at school we studied Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, we were told to ignore whole sections because they contained apparently loose disconnected aphorisms, including some horrible stuff about women, and some, uh, interesting views on race. But more on that later. But we were told this was not important to understanding the rest of the text, perhaps because they thought this was part of the Nietzschean plurality that could be removed, to give a cleaner view of the aspects of his ideas that were the focus of our lessons, and therefore that ideas like master and slave morality, a core concept of that text, could be separated from Nietzsche's apparently offhand comments about gender and race. Many popular readings of Nietzsche emphasise this experience of disconnection and plurality, and even go so far as to say Nietzsche's work is inessential, or even postmodern. That is to say that there is no core to Nietzsche, but the conflict and division between his various points is the point. Derrida, one of the proponents and popularizers of this view, put it like this. Was not Nietzsche one of the few great thinkers who multiplied his names and played with his signatures, identities and masks? And what if that would be the heart of the matter, the causa, the straight fall of his thinking? This all leads to a popular view of Nietzsche as a sort of psychological philosopher who asks us to challenge our internal assumptions in a process of self-overcoming to achieve a higher state of being through transvaluation of your beliefs, and that his various examples basically offer us thought experiments to reach this, but do not represent a coherent thought like a political ideology or something of that order, but more of a network of ideas and wise sayings, a bit like in Buddhist texts which, while occasionally objectionable, are aimed at taking us beyond this sort of Christian restrictiveness by embracing all of life in a sacred yes. In this way, Nietzsche is read not as a thinker of politics and society, but almost as a sort of high philosophical self-help, aiming to show people how to overcome the tethers of this nihilistic, Christian-inspired worldview, though this is not usually how it is explained exactly. This was a view which helped rehabilitate Nietzsche's thought and philosophy, after a period of unpopularity due to the fact he was heavily referenced by Nazi and other fascist thinkers, notably Hitler. Much scholarship has gone into showing that Nietzsche himself was not, in fact, a Nazi, and even the editing of his later work by his more Nazi-inclined sister may have contributed to the ease by which his work could be appropriated. They also point to his dispute with his one-time idol, the classical composer Richard Wagner, in which he explicitly attacks Wagnerian anti-Semitism, as evidence that the Nazi reading of Nietzsche is not a reflection on the actual philosophy. Nietzsche also inspired many left-wing and even revolutionary thinkers, some of whom have even gone so far as to suggest that there was some cryptic revolutionary spirit in Nietzsche. And certainly, even today, many on the left are happy to reference Nietzsche without thinking of his work as directly contradictory to their views. All of this is relevant, of course, and certainly Nietzsche's views were not synonymous with those of the Nazi party or Hitler himself. But while Nietzsche was by no means a literal Nazi, simply asserting that fact, in my view, glosses over a much more important question of what elements within Nietzsche, misread or otherwise, helped lead to the Nazis and to fascism. This is something I hope to examine over the course of this video. But this inessentialist and evasive notion of Nietzsche is not universal. Some would say that Nietzsche's work is much more internally coherent and actually does offer some form of a political project. There is, in fact, another reading of Nietzsche as a philosopher of power, an inherently political philosopher. The Marxist philosopher, George Lukacs, no, I said Lukacs, not Lucas, explained why the plurality of readings of Nietzsche, for him, did not exclude an essence, but in fact simply enabled that essence to be expressed, and therefore influence people, in more diverse ways. But this was not at random, but always in the service of Nietzsche's essential support for the ruling class, and their continued power. Nietzsche's myths and aphorisms, depending on the bourgeoisie's immediate interests in their ideologues' endeavors, could be arranged and interpreted in the most diverse, often dramatically opposed ways. But the constant harking back to Nietzsche, in each instance a new Nietzsche, shows that there was definite continuity beneath it all. Ishe Lander states this even more clearly, saying, Nietzsche's ethics aesthetics, and epistemology do not hold an independent status in his writings, and they certainly do not model and dictate his political line. They rather stem from, reflect, and draw upon his fundamental socio-political convictions. Part 1. The Politics of Nietzsche So what are Nietzsche's fundamental socio-political convictions? Well, let's start with one of his most famous concepts. Aphorism 1. God is dead, so you can't have nice things. 
So one line we all know from Nietzsche is that God is dead, a line he takes from the individualist anarchist Max Stirner, who I also think is a bit of a knob, but perhaps that's a topic for another video. But what does Nietzsche want us to understand by the death of God? So for Nietzsche, the death of God symbolises the triumph of the secular and scientific worldview over the religious, and Nietzsche rightly points out that this raises quite a few issues with how we construct our society, and especially our morality. He uses a genealogical method to suggest that the contemporary moral system was built on Christian values, and that these values relied on the existence of a god to function. Not killing because God said thou shalt not seems pretty erroneous when you no longer believe in said god. Thus Nietzsche wants to transvaluate our morality away from these Christian underpinnings. So far, this all sounds pretty good, right? I mean, we all hate the church with its corrupt power structures that hypocritically preach what they do not practice, with their deceiving of the masses to inspire conformity. As Marx said, religion is the opiate of the masses, so surely expunging this opiate is, like, a good thing. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I should just cry out. Friedrich, baby, I take it back. Let's go fight like lions against religious dogmatism and oppression. But then, when Nietzsche talks about Christianity, does he mean the same thing as me? Well, to answer that question, we're going to have to move on to another concept. Aphorism 2. Let's play masters and slaves. But not in a fun way. So for Nietzsche, Christianity is an example of slave morality which he juxtaposes to master morality. He lays these concepts out in a chapter of Beyond Good and Evil called What is Noble? And it's pretty clear in his wording which of these he thinks is the more noble. In a tour of moralities, two basic types were revealed. There is master morality and slave morality. Moral value distinctions have arisen within either a dominating type that, with a feeling of well-being, was conscious of the difference between itself and those who were dominated, or, alternatively, these distinctions arose among the dominated people themselves, the slaves and dependents of every rank. In the first case, when dominating people determine the concept of good, it is elevated, proud states of soul that are perceived as distinctive and as determining rank order. The noble type of person feels that he determines value. He does not need anyone's approval, he judges that what is harmful to me is harmful in itself. He knows that he is the one who gives honour to things in the first place. He creates values. He honours everything he sees in himself. This sort of morality is self-glorifying. The noble person helps the unfortunate too, although not or hardly ever out of pity, but rather more out of an impulse generated by the overabundance of power. In honouring himself, the nobleman honours the powerful as well as those who have power over themselves, who know how to speak and be silent, who joyfully exercise severity and harshness over themselves and have respect for all forms of severity and harshness. A faith in yourself, pride in yourself, and a fundamental hostility and irony with respect to selflessness belong to a noble morality just as certainly as does a slight disdain and caution towards sympathetic feelings and warm hearts. The powerful are the ones who know how to honour. It is their art, their realm of invention. The profound reverence for age and origins. The whole notion of justice is based on this double reverence. A faith and a prejudice in favour of forefathers and against future generations is typical of the morality of the powerful. And when, conversely, people with modern ideas believe almost instinctively in progress and the future, and show a decreasing respect for age, this gives sufficient evidence of the ignoble origin of these ideas. But, most of all, the morality of dominating types is foreign and painful to contemporary taste due to its stern axiom that people have duties only toward their own kind, that when it comes to creatures of a lower rank, to everything alien, people are allowed to act as they see fit or from the heart, and in any event, beyond good and evil. So we see here that the master morality is characterised by harshness, lack of pity, a strong sense of your place in a social hierarchy, indifference to those lower unless it enhances your power, and above all, a love of power and its use. But he thinks that this aristocratic morality is not the dominant morality of his time. This may seem an odd thing to say, as these master values, such as caring for those of your own kind over others, and loving the repression of those you consider weaker, 
in the context of the late 19th century, an age where capitalism was little restricted, but more to the point, colonialism saw European powers prioritizing themselves and justifying all sorts of horrific atrocities against others around the world through their empires, seems not to be so out of step with the values of the time as he claims. However, he sees the dominant morality as slave morality, which he claims is born out of a resentment for the power of the masters. It is different with the second type of morality, slave morality. What if people who are violated, oppressed, suffering, unfree, exhausted, and unsure of themselves were to moralize? What type of moral valuations would they have? A pessimistic suspicion of the whole condition of humanity would probably find expression, perhaps a condemnation of humanity along with its condition. The slave's gaze resents the virtues of the powerful. It is skeptical and distrustful. It has a subtle mistrust of all the good that is honored there. It wants to convince itself that even happiness is not genuine there. Conversely, qualities that serve to alleviate existence for suffering people are pulled out and flooded with light. Pity, the obliging, helpful hand, the warm heart, patience, industriousness, humility, and friendliness receive full honours here, since these are the most useful qualities and practically the only way of holding up under the pressure of existence. Slave morality is essentially a morality of utility. Here we have the point of origin for that famous opposition between good and evil. Evil is perceived as something powerful and dangerous. It's felt to contain a certain awesome quality, a subtlety and strength that block any incipient contempt. According to the slave morality then, evil inspires fear, but according to the master morality, it's good that inspires and wants to inspire fear, while the bad man is seen as contemptible. The opposition comes to a head when, following the logic of slave morality, a hint of contempt, however slight and well disposed, finally comes to be associated with even its idea of good, because within the terms of slave morality, the good man must always be unthreatening, he is good-natured, easy to deceive, maybe a bit stupid. Wherever slave morality holds sway, language shows a tendency for the words good and stupid to come closer together. A final fundamental distinction. The desire for freedom, the instinct for happiness, and subtleties in the feeling of freedom necessarily belong to slave morals and morality, just as an artistry and enthusiasm in respect and devotion are invariant symptoms of an aristocratic mode of thinking and valuing. This clearly shows why love as passion, our European specialty, must have had a purely noble descent. So for Nietzsche, slave morality idolizes equality and rejects power, does not respect traditions, and preaches helping people and patience. It is also apparently utilitous, which is apparently bad, and this is also apparently different from master morality, which is natural. Of course, the utility of master morality in maintaining and justifying one's power over the slave is not due for consideration here. It promotes stupidity, passivity, and freedom. And this, apparently, means it does not have the capacity to produce art or passion. Now, just put a pin in that art reference for a second, because we're going to come back to that later. Overall, it is clear here that, for Nietzsche, the moralizing of those who are victims of oppression is deficient, while the morals of the oppressor are noble. This alone should be a red flag not only to socialists, with regard to excluding the voices of the workers, but to any anti-racist, feminist, or supporter of LGBTQIA rights or disability rights or any other minority causes. In fact, anyone who thinks that it is important to address the concerns of those disempowered by our system, or that we should even address injustice at all, or even have democracy. By this idea, it is basically impossible to complain, as by being a victim, your moralizing is immediately invalid. So, far from a revelatory philosophy of self-overcoming, this feels like a pure social conservatism, trying to fix rather than change social relations. Or even worse, a notion of social degeneracy as we find in far-right texts. But we'll come onto that more later. For now, we can clearly see that what Nietzsche dislikes in Christianity is not its authoritative tendencies. In fact, there's a passage in Beyond Good and Evil where he actively praises saints as people who found out how to use slave morality to maximize their power. This is not a criticism of the manipulative practices of organized religion, it is a critique of what many of us might think of as the good parts of Christianity. 
love thy neighbor, to which Nietzsche professes to prefer fear of one's neighbor. Be kind to the poor, and we are all created equal. Meanwhile, much of what I hate about Christianity is lauded in the former of these quotes. Hierarchy and the assertion of power as is complete disdain for those beneath one's status. So perhaps if we want to find out Nietzsche's political views, we need to clarify his views on class. Aphorism 3. Your children will work for our children, because art. Some thinkers have tried to reclaim Nietzsche, beyond just being not a Nazi or a fascist, to the point of implying he may actually have had some left, Keynesian or even socialist leanings, especially in the middle period around works like Human All Too Human and The Gay Science. Again, this is not the fun kind. This may seem an appealing argument if we look at the following passage from one of his essays. What we now refer to as justice is from this point of view a highly refined usefulness, which does not take in consideration only the present moment and exploits the opportunity, but rather reflects the responsibility on the lasting consequences therefore taking care of the well-being of the worker, his physical and spiritual satisfaction. The exploitation of the worker was, as one now understands, a stupidity and ruthless enterprise at the cost of the future. However, this passage reveals far more about Nietzsche's class interests if we look at the words I missed out there with those three dots. Taking care of the well-being of the worker, his physical and spiritual satisfaction in order that he and his descendants will continue to work for our descendants and will be available for a longer period of time than a single individual's life. So we see that any kindness to workers for Nietzsche is to be predicated on their continued usefulness to the elite, the bourgeoisie, a group for whom he clearly feels affinity as he refers to the workers as they and includes himself in the class of those they work for by using the word our. But this is a very soft telling of Nietzsche's view on class relations in which he grudgingly concedes some goods to the workers to secure their support. Much of his engagement with this issue is not so gentle, and clearly, this is not his ideal class relation, more of a grudging payoff to keep the workers in line. So what does Nietzsche think class relations should ideally be, and why? Well, perhaps this passage from his essay The Greek State might be more revealing. And remember that bit before, where I said how masters can produce art but slaves can't for Nietzsche? Well, that's pretty important here. In order for there to be a broad, deep, fertile soil for the development of art, the overwhelming majority has to be slavishly subjected to life's necessity in the service of the minority, beyond the measure necessary for the individual. At their expense, through their extra work, that privileged class is to be removed from the struggle for existence in order to produce and satisfy a new world of necessities. Accordingly, we should learn to identify as a cruel-sounding truth the fact that slavery belongs to the essence of culture. The misery of men living a life of toil has to be increased to make possible the production of the world of art for a small number of Olympian men. So, for Nietzsche, the majority of humanity should be enslaved with increasing toil to facilitate a small group of Olympian men in making art. This is the already dodgy great man theory of history taken to the extreme, and it is clear that any help given to those lower is only so that they should work. Certainly, he does not approve of social welfare for, say, the sick or disabled, as he notes in Twilight of the Idols. Morality for doctors. The sick person is a parasite on society. In a certain condition, living any longer is improper. Vegetating on in cowardly dependence on doctors and treatments, once the meaning of life, the right to life, has been lost, should incur the profound contempt of society. Furthermore, doctors should be the ones to convey this contempt. Not prescriptions, but every day a new dose of disgust with their patients. To create a new responsibility, the responsibility of the doctor, in all cases in which the highest interest of life, of ascending life, demands that degenerating life be shoved under and shoved aside with no mercy whatsoever. So Nietzsche clearly openly favours a very rigid class system in which the majority work for a few in order to make art, and anyone not useful in this dynamic can pretty well die. But while hierarchical, authoritarian and class-based, much like our current system, surely this idea, which he often touts as at odds with the values of our time, is still pretty radical, right? It's a big shake-up to the social structures. Right? Aphorism 4. 
the will to propertied classes and a rentier system. So in this section, I'm going to talk a bit about liberalism. Now, just a note, when I'm using this term here, I'm using it to refer to the philosophical tradition of liberalism and the societies formed thereon, by which I mean modern capitalist states since roughly the 18th century. This is a political philosophy which emerged from the bourgeois class, whose accumulation of wealth from their economic practice of capitalism had led them to challenge the old aristocracies and merge with or replace them to varying extents to form a new ruling class. If you're not already used to this usage of the word, I suggest you watch my Dark Side of Liberalism series, which is only um, five episodes long. Should only take you like three hours or so. But in case you don't have time for that, I will recap it a little bit here. Okay, so now you're back and definitely understand all that, let's put Nietzsche into the context of liberalism and the actual class relations that existed in his time. So, obviously, it's the mid to late 19th century, and we are well into the period when liberalism and capitalism is the dominant political matrix through which the world is to be interpreted. As I noted in part one of The Dark Side of Liberalism, at this time, liberalism did not have it easy. It was going through something which Lander refers to as the liberal split. The advent of democracy had forced a contradiction on liberalism. In its early period, it had been able to ascribe to itself values of liberty, equality and fraternity, while also practicing and upholding an economic system, capitalism, which was to the disadvantage of the majority of the people, and which left the empowered few, the bourgeois ruling class, who had risen with their political philosophy of liberalism and their economic practice of capitalism, which had so enriched them, owning almost all the property and means of production, and exploiting the labour of and extracting rents from the majority of people by using this property. This led John Locke, one of the foundational thinkers of liberalism, to call property the end of government and that for which men enter into society. This had been a fairly functional balance at first, as the bourgeois were able to monopolise the reins of power, but over the early 19th century democracy had begun to loom, and now many a liberal ruling class had to work out how to deal with a working class who may be able to exert the original bourgeois demands from the French and American revolutions for liberty, equality and fraternity on behalf not of the bourgeois, but of the whole of the population. This of course was a threat to their property, and to capitalism, and the fear spread of the poor voting for high taxes for services or even redistribution of property from the rich, who consider themselves the rightful owners of power and property. The emergence of socialist movements with these very demands of course fueled further unease among the ruling class. This put the economic and political agendas of liberalism into conflict, pushing various thinkers to choose to double down one way or the other. Some did go the social and political liberal route, and even became socialists in some cases, but many of the most famous thinkers of the liberal canon chose to double down on the economics, requiring some kind of limit or even the cessation of democracy, and of course, a very strong opposition to socialism. To read Nietzsche from this angle, we can begin to situate him in line with the thinkers of his time. For example, if we think back to the above quotation about slavery and art, we can see his ideas, far from being radical, align quite closely with the liberal discourse around democracy at the time. For example, this quote from J.S. Mill, which even uses the same metaphor of fertile soil. Persons of genius, it is true, are and are always likely to be a small minority. But in order to have them, it is necessary to preserve the soil in which they grow. In sober truth, the general tendency of things throughout the world is to render mediocrity the ascendant power among mankind. Nietzsche agrees with Mill on this point, though his terms are more dramatic. However, from fertility to the notion of mediocrity, which we will come to shortly, there is a common language between these thinkers being deployed in very similar ways. Nietzsche's specific alignments on socialism and capitalism are rarely explicitly expressed. He prefers to use Christianity as a cipher for socialism, because if you hadn't noticed, that's kind of what he's doing here. Nietzsche's anti-Christianity is inherently anti-socialist. That's not to say that this is the only function of Nietzsche's critique of Christianity, but it is a major role of it. However, there are some passages that do make this pretty clear. But there will always be too many who have possessions for socialism to signify more than an attack of sickness. And those who have possessions are of one mind on one article of fate. One must possess something in order to be something. So here he does make it clear he is directly opposed to socialism. And the association of owning with being again put him squarely on the side of the propertied liberal class. 
But, of course, capitalism isn't just owning. There's systems of accumulation and growth. But this is the oldest and healthiest of instincts. I should add, one must want to have more than one has in order to become more. For this is the doctrine preached by life itself to all that has life. The morality of development. To have and to want to have more. Growth, in one word. That is life itself. So for Nietzsche, these capitalist forms, possession, accumulation and growth, are the basis of life itself. And in case you thought this might just be allegorical and not economic terms, he clarifies this, in terms which could be read as an oblique response to Marx on exploitation. Life itself is essentially appropriation, injury, overpowering of the strange and weaker, suppression, severity, imposition of one's own forms, incorporation and, at the very mildest, exploitation. Exploitation does not pertain to a corrupt or imperfect or primitive society. It pertains to the essence of the living thing as a fundamental organic function. It is a function of the intrinsic will to power, which is precisely the will to life. So not only does he think capitalist exploitation and ownership is a fundamental life force, which might lead us to ask why we don't see apes engaged in employment or almost any other species that holds private possessions, but he also situates this again at the core of his philosophy, by associating it to his famous fundamental concept of the will to power. The will to power is for Nietzsche the fundamental force which drives life, synonymous as shown here with a will to life. However, we also see here that it functions for Nietzsche as a naturalization of authoritarian and capitalistic forces, and places these forces as the primary drivers and motivators of life. And in terms of an essential core to Nietzsche, it's not hard to see how this position easily marries with Nietzsche's discussion of masters and slaves earlier. But what becomes even more apparent on close inspection is just how mundane this philosophy actually is. Beneath all this poetic language is merely an endorsement of capitalist relations broadly as they exist. This is also, it's worth noting, an individualist philosophy, in which the highest value is the individual trying to better themselves. But the form this individualism takes requires an underclass, who are unable to participate in that individualism, to facilitate the individualism of the great men. As I noted in part two of The Dark Side of Liberalism, this is exactly the form individualism takes in liberal and capitalist philosophies too. This naturalization of capitalist relationships is also framed in an evolutionary way, with each striving for mastery and, as we shall see later, each master striving towards the overman. So Nietzsche's philosophy is in this way a form of social Darwinism, a concept that I explore, and show why it's ridiculous, again in part two of The Dark Side of Liberalism, so check it out there. But to be short here, this is again very clearly in line with other liberal and conservative philosophies of the mainstream of Nietzsche's time. That Nietzsche's concerns can be summed up in economic terms is in fact confirmed by the man himself. I attempt an economic justification of virtue. The task is to make man as useful as possible and to approximate him as far as possible to an infallible machine. He must learn to experience the states in which he works in a mechanically useful way as the supremely valuable states. Hence it is necessary to spoil the other states for him as much as possible, as highly dangerous and disreputable. So we can see here how, for Nietzsche, the competitive striving of capitalism is the fundamental force in the world and this situates him in line with a fairly standard liberal economic position. But beyond just a sense that the lower classes are meant to serve, Nietzsche also shows a strong distaste for the lower classes and their cultural productions. Remember, he actually said they couldn't produce art before. In contrast to the high regard for the actions and cultural productions of the elite, whose art they facilitate through their enslavement. Aphorism 5 you're the last man, I'm the first. I'm the cleverest, and you're the worst. Two concepts which help us further elucidate Nietzsche's views on class and politics are the oft-referred to notion of the Ubermensch, Overman or Superman, and its less touted counterpart, the Last or Ultimate Man. These figures effectively represent the respective extremes of the two moralities we explored earlier, Master and Slave. 
In one way, we can see these concepts as the prophetic symbols by which Nietzsche describes how he imagined society would progress based on prioritising one or other of these value systems. Nietzsche describes the last or ultimate man as the most contemptible man. But again, we see what this contempt is for here. Behold, I show you the ultimate man. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? The ultimate man asks and blinks. The earth has become small, and on it hops the ultimate man who makes everything small. His race is as inexterminable as the flea. The ultimate man lives longest. We have discovered happiness, say the ultimate men, and blink. They left the places where living was hard, for one needs warmth. One still loves one's neighbour and rubs oneself against him, for one needs warmth. They still work, for work is entertainment, but they take care that the entertainment does not exhaust them. Nobody grows rich or poor anymore, both are too much of a burden. Who wants to rule? Who obey? Both are too much of a burden. No herdsman and one herd. Everyone wants the same thing, and everyone is the same. Whoever thinks otherwise goes voluntarily into the madhouse. We have discovered happiness, say the ultimate men, and they blink. So what does Nietzsche find contemptible in his prophesied ultimate or last man? Much as we saw with slavery and Christianity, it is equality, empathy, sharing, seeking to spread happiness, the lack of a rich and poor, or a class system, and the lack of herdsmen or rulers. The last man is hated for his socialism and his democracy. Nietzsche, like when describing slave morality, sees the values of the masses or herd as weak and the culture they produce as mediocre, while seeing the cruelty of the masters as essential to their cultural worth. He also sees the last men as stupid, though at the same time describes them as knowing a lot. But, as is clear from their supposed blinking in this quote, the last men are unable to answer fundamental questions of existence for Nietzsche, as for him, the real truth is in the will to power, in the overcoming and exploiting of others. The joy of this truth is destroyed when the masses get too close, of course. Life is a fountain of delight, but where the rabble also drinks, all wells are poisoned. This hatred for the masses can be pretty infectious when one is not recognising what Nietzsche's project is here. Many people, when coming to understand their world, feel that they are special, that they understand where others don't, and look down on pop culture as banal and unintelligent, which is not in any way universally true, but is a common perception. And Nietzsche nurtures that sense of isolation, and entices us to consider those around us lower than us. He is appealing to a sort of dark academia egoist inside us. It's hardly surprising that this is a common tendency. Much of our literature conveys the mass or the working classes as something stupid, disgusting or alien, a force which can't understand the lived experience of that special person who is the protagonist. This may have something to do with the fact that the bourgeoisie and ruling class have produced most of this literature, but as a result, many educated on this literature are likely to feel an affinity with such an isolating worldview. In this way, Nietzsche is part of a long tradition of communicating this bourgeois affectation, which is itself appealing to many a young would-be intellectual who feels somehow isolated from their community. This dim view of the masses, and consequently of democracy, is one shared again by many liberal thinkers, with abundant examples of such views in such canonical thinkers as Locke, Mill, and de Tocqueville. But I covered quotes showing this in part two of my Dark Side of Liberalism series, so to save time here, I will direct you there for evidence on this point. For myself, as a leftist, a socialist, and an anarchist, and as a strong proponent of this thing called democracy, it's my view that we should trust the masses to a great extent, and that they are capable of making autonomous decisions which impact their lives. Such a thought is directly contrary to Nietzsche, but because Nietzsche frames his criticism so indirectly most of the time, his ideas are often easily assimilatable by people who otherwise hold contradictory views, like myself when I was young. Or, for a more prominent example from the anarchist community, please don't hate me folks, I love the rest of her work, Emma Goldman. Goldman was openly influenced by Nietzsche, and held his work in some regard, as well as being influenced by Stirner, who was also a massive influence on Nietzsche. In reading Goldman, I would say we can actually see this concept of the last man impacting her work and her ideas of the masses, in passages like this. That the mass bleeds, that it is being robbed and exploited, I know as well as our vote baiters. But I insist that not the handful of parasites, but the mass itself, is responsible for this horrible state of affairs. 
It clings to its masters, loves the whip, and is the first to cry, crucify. The socialist demagogues know that as well as I, but they maintain the myth of the virtues of the majority, because their very scheme of life means the perpetuation of power. And how could the latter be acquired without numbers? Yes, authority, coercion, and dependence rest on the mass, but never freedom, or the free unfoldment of the individual, never the birth of a free society. Not because I do not feel with the oppressed, the disinherited of the earth. Not because I do not know the shame, the horror, the indignity of the lives the people lead, do I repudiate the majority as a creative force for good. Oh, no, no, but because I know so well that as a compact mass it has never stood for justice or equality. It has suppressed the human voice, subdued the human spirit, chained the human body. As a mass, its aim has always been to make life uniform, gray, and monotonous as the desert. As a mass, it will always be the annihilator of individuality, of free initiative, of originality. I therefore believe, with Emerson, that the masses are crude, lame, pernicious in their demands and influence and need not be flattered, but to be schooled. I wish not to concede anything to them, but to drill, divide, and break them up, and draw individuals out of them. Masses. The calamity are the masses. I do not wish any mass at all, but honest men only. Lovely, sweet, accomplished women only. In other words, the living, vital truth of social and economic well-being will become a reality only through the zeal, courage, and non-compromising determination of intelligent minorities, and not through the mass. Here we see Goldman, while standing for the cause of the masses, also decrying their culture as loving to be ruled and nurturing mediocrity, and ends up arguing for a somewhat vanguardist notion of revolution, pushed by intelligent minorities, rather than a mass movement of people determining and fighting for their own interests. In my view, this is actually quite a condescending face to turn to the masses, and as I discussed in my recent video from Gesture to Solidarity, and in my recent interview with D. Hunter, author of Chav Solidarity, Allowing the oppressed to lead in their own emancipation is an essential part of how we should organise and how we should approach the working class. In this way, I feel this Nietzschean undercurrent detracts from and undermines not only Goldman's other good points, but when applied in anarchist practice, our very methods of organising by solidarity and unity and mutual aid and education within the so-called masses. By undermining our ability to trust them as potential democratic actors, even outside the coercive systems of the state and capitalist propaganda, and encouraging elitist and egotistical attitudes which are not ideologically or practically consistent with socialist aims. In this way, an influx of Nietzschean ideas can cause serious harm in how we approach the people around us. As an aside, Stirner, also often beloved of anarchists, in fact also agrees with Nietzsche on many more things, though the influential relationship here is reversed, Stirner having inspired Nietzsche. However, while I think Nietzscheanism in Goldman is a smear on an otherwise excellent theorist and activist, Stirner is for me too far the other way, and, like Nietzsche, I would say his philosophy hides some pretty dark leanings that are too often ignored. Basically, I'm not a fan, but I'll probably do a separate video on that sometime. If you want a good critique of Stirner's ideas, and his commonalities with Nietzsche though, there is a section in Lander's Overman in the Marketplace, so you can go and read it there. But anyway, we've got a little bit off topic here, so let's go back to Nietzsche proper. So in essence, we see Nietzsche hates the masses in this very classic conservative way of saying equality leads to mediocrity, and prophesizes a world in which their mediocrity leads to more equality and pleasant working conditions and apparently a lot of blinking. And this is apparently a bad thing? So what is Nietzsche's more supposedly positive prophetic vision? What of the Superman. Aphorism 6. Intellectual Edgelord Men Uber Alleys. Nietzsche juxtaposes his supposed horror story of the last man with his visionary alternative project, the Overman, Superman, or Ubermensch. When studying Nietzsche, we often think of the Overman as the final point in this masterful overcoming of the self in order to live without God, the fulfilment of Nietzsche's psychological project the goal of this Nietzschean self-help. This is not completely inaccurate, but what I want to focus on here is not this broad role of the overman, but the content of this concept. What is he overcoming in order to live without God? One thing the overman is definitively not, as has been regularly pointed out, is some concept of an ethnically perfect human, and this is often held up as a reason for disassociating Nietzsche from the Nazis. 
It is a truism readily trotted out, as it was recently in a Guardian review of Sue Prido's recent biography of Nietzsche. But while it is easy to see how this notion arose, Nietzsche's ideas about the Ubermensch could easily be repurposed as an argument for Aryan supremacy. This was, in fact, a severe misreading of his work. Thus, this view implies that this simple misreading of the Ubermensch was the access point of fascism to Nietzsche, and that the fact that the Ubermensch do not signify a racial perfection shows that this fascist reading must be false. This view has the advantage of being basically true. It is clear that this is not the meaning of the Ubermensch. However, it also implies that the right-wing reading of Nietzsche is so sloppy as not to notice this in Nietzsche, and constructs the Aryan race reading as the only possible fascist interpretation. To see why this might be an oversimplification, not just of Nietzsche, but of the fascist reading of him, let's finally look at what the Overman is. So the Overman may not be a biological master race as such, but Nietzsche certainly sees it as an intellectual and psychological transcendence of the current state of humanity, offered as a prophecy of the next stage of evolution, and explicitly as one which must be strived for. So, while we are not clearly situated in the field of biological eugenics as such, a sort of psychological conditioning of populations towards this goal is essential for Nietzsche, to prevent the slip into the world of the last men, which, as we discussed before, is essentially socialism. The Overman is then a sort of all-competent figure who is able to be an independent individualist and assert his will to power over the masses. Now, as I've said, it's often emphasised that the Overman is not a racialized figure, and a racial project for it is never clearly defined. However, it is worth noting that while Nietzsche does disavow some racism, most notably anti-Semitism, he does so in a way which is pretty grounded in the language of racial taxonomy and hierarchy. The Jews, however, are beyond all doubt the strongest, toughest, and purest race living in Europe. This may be a disavowal of anti-Semitism, but the notions of racial hierarchy and purity are still very much at work in his phrasing, so the openness to a racial element is not completely excluded. Though it is worth noting that Nietzsche did strongly oppose nationalism, even German nationalism, in these same passages. Nietzsche sees preparing for the coming of the Overman, and the overcoming of humanity as a condition, as the most important point for humans to work towards, as he says in the final part of Zarathustra. The Overman is in my heart. That is my first and my only concern. And not human beings, not the neighbour, not the poorest, not the most suffering, not the best. This quote further illustrates how the Overman is, for Nietzsche, a prophetic goal, something that society has to move towards, and the lack of care for humanity and so on, exhibited here, highlights, as I have said, how this goal is really just the complete following through of Nietzsche's master morality we discussed above, in all of its horrifying implications. It is the opposite and antidote to the last man, to the supposed nihilism of the egalitarians, and as the last man aligns with slave morality, we can see how the overman aligns with the values of the master, not caring about the poor or giving any pity to suffering, but living in line with the will to power, which, as we have seen above, is basically a naturalised expression of market conditions. So the overman is effectively, in part at least, an atheist equipped to excel individualistically in a capitalist system at the expense of others, and without having to deal with any of the moral or emotional baggage that that oppression over others might cause. Also, it is worth noting that, for Nietzsche, the overman is clearly a man. Nietzsche considered feminine intellectualism a sexual pathology, as he elucidated in one of those aphorisms which I was directed away from when I was studying Beyond Good and Evil for my A-levels. When a woman has scholarly inclinations, there is usually something wrong with her sexuality. Unfruitfulness itself disposes one to a certain masculinity of taste. And in the very next aphorism... Comparing man and woman in general, one may say, woman would not have the genius for finery if she did not have the instinct for the secondary role. So yeah, Overman, totally a bloke. And here's a bloke who can reject the crude Christian limits of the last man's socialism and embrace a new value system, a value system which Nietzsche refers to as Dionysian. Aphorism 7. The Dionysian, I don't give a fuck. So Dionysus was a Greek wine god, and Nietzsche has a super hard-on for the ancient Greeks, so he calls his world-loving, self-overcoming endpoint an embrace of Dionysian values. And you know, overcoming yourself and loving the world and partying like a wine god? That again, sounds pretty good, right? And you get there through all these, like, 
badass mystical phases. You get to see snakes eating their own tails, and overcome the spirit of gravity, and all that. One of the best known passages about this is the three metamorphoses of the soul, which are described early in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So the soul first becomes a camel, because it wants to bear the burden of all the heavy things of the world, and it gets heavy under these responsibilities, like, you know, other people and stuff like that. Society. But then, out in the desert, it meets this dragon, who, in the subtlest metaphor ever, has thou shalt written on every scale. Oh no, it's the dragon of moralising Christianity! So then the soul drops its camel form and its heavy load to become a lion and dispels the terrifying dragon of responsibility and frees itself from the values of a thousand years. But to form new values, Nietzsche tells us it must then become a child in order to go from the refusal of the old to the sacred yes of the new. That's it in a nutshell anyway. Again, all very pretty, but when we scratch beneath the surface, as we've already seen, the same problems seem to appear. Nietzsche tells us he's opposing a thousand years of thou shalt, and we think of the repressive laws of our society. But what we often miss is that the thou shalt that Nietzsche is really concerned about are thou shalt not exploit the other, thou shalt love thy neighbour, thou shalt share. It's not only the rules of God, but popular notions of equality that he wants to shed. He wants to purge the guilt of the ruling classes for the exploitation, violence and theft they enact at the expense of those they consider lower, by naturalising it into a new spiritually styled order, without prohibitions on the enslavement and subjugation of those he considers weaker. If we are all to be Dionysians, then, it seems we must behave like the super-rich. However, of course, there's never enough to go around to let everyone have that. And as we saw above, Nietzsche knows this. He knows that the Dionysian yes is at the expense of the overwhelming majority, which has to be slavishly subjected to life's necessity in the service of the minority beyond the measure necessary for the individual. This overcoming is not an overcoming of our limitations in terms of our current system, it is an overcoming of our conscience and the ways in which it holds us back from embracing the full logic of our system of class, power and exploitation. It is truly an opposite to Christianity, but not to that reading of Christianity that suppresses popular movements and upholds social conservatisms, but to that reading of Christianity that sees Jesus as a socialist. Nietzsche agrees Jesus is a socialist, and that is why he hates him. In this way, the Dionysian yes is at the same time a fuck you to all who must suffer to produce the Dionysian paradise for the few. It is an abdication of responsibility for the suffering of the many. In fact, it endorses, it lords their suffering. It is saying yes to the ruling class priority of maximising your power and fuck you to anyone who gets in your way. This dispassionate, pleasure-seeking ideal in some ways reflects the famous Italian fascist phrase, Mi ne frego, I'm probably mispronouncing that, which means I don't care, which Melania Trump was criticised for referencing on the back of her coat when visiting an immigration centre some time back. On the surface, I don't care and the Dionysian yes don't seem so similar, but when we look at what they imply, the complete acceptance of, effectively, all the injustice of the world, and seeking to overcome them in the sense, essentially, of being on the winning side, I think we can see that these phrases are not so far apart. So at this point, I think we have enough information to start putting together a clearer picture of the politics of Nietzsche, so let's sum it up a bit now and try and clarify his position. Aphorism 8. The Anti-Marx So, as I have already commented above, Nietzsche's project was concerned with the psychological conditioning of a ruling and working class, through individualism and the seeking of property, to best overcome the former state of humanity and best fit themselves for capitalism, and in doing so, attempts to naturalise capitalist forces and demonise the lower classes. His struggle is not just against Christianity, but against the growth of any egalitarian philosophy which he denounces for its Christian spirit and claims will lead to mediocrity. In this way, he's not only playing the Antichrist, as he self-described, but at the same time, he is positioning himself as the anti-Marx. Where Marx prophesies the coming of communism to end the struggle of classes, Nietzsche seeks the overman to normalise and love the brutality of class relations and to prevent the slip into what he sees as the mediocrity of a classless society. This puts it directly in line with the economic turn of the liberal split, as we described above when anxieties about democracy and mass participation led many liberals to reassert the values of elitism and capitalism in the face of growing democratic movements which they worried could threaten their property and power. 
So is Nietzsche therefore a liberal? Well, he certainly does not want us to think so. While he shares many views with them, he's also very critical of liberalism, especially its ethical concerns, in which he sees the danger of egalitarian values creeping in. As such, he was critical of the economic turn against political liberalism for not sticking rigidly enough to the implications of its own economic model. As Lander describes, Nietzsche's concept of a utilitarianism, the mainstream British liberal theory of ethics, as decadent was by no means a critique of capitalism as an economic system, but on the contrary, an attempt to neutralize what was considered a decaying element of bourgeoisie culture and politics, which may eventually eat into the foundations of the class system and veer towards democracy and socialism. In other words, Nietzsche rebuked the bourgeoisie for not being capitalistic enough. Utilitarianism, according to Nietzsche, was merely a democratic prelude to socialism, as attested to particularly by its emphasis on the happiness of the greater number. This certainly seems consistent with the earlier quote about enslaving humanity for the sake of art. Nietzsche endorses the class system, but not the idea that it should aim at expanding happiness, but, as we saw above, thinks the overwhelming majority has to be slavishly subjected to life's necessity in the service of the minority, beyond the measure necessary for the individual. So Nietzsche chides the bourgeois not for their class position, but for failing to effectively defend it from the threat of the masses, and, for its lack of harshness, wants to replace it with a system that fully naturalises and embraces capitalist competition and class, to put an end to these egalitarian impulses which he finds so threatening. There are some other thinkers around Nietzsche's time and thereafter who do share this angle of rebuking liberalism for its failure to protect the ruling class interests. The upper classes have become gutless and demoralised. They patiently endure every insult, threat and oppression. They are only too anxious to avoid irritating their enemies, kissing the hand that strikes them. Even when a strike is beaten, they are too weak need to follow up their victory. I will do the commons no wrong. The upper classes have followed this advice throughout the 19th century and up to the present day, never uniting to throw off the burden. Each one of them strives to push it off onto the next man. By such internal discords, they make themselves even weaker as a social group. Is it wrong that I'm picturing General Hux when I'm reading this? And from another thinker? When the wealth that has accumulated among the ruling class is annihilated by the attacks of the mob, when it becomes suspicious and disdainful, a danger to the owners, then the Nordic will to acquire property, to power through property, ceases to create that wealth. And now, a later thinker, who is in agreement that we need to make class relations appear as a precondition of thought, as Nietzsche sought to do in naturalizing them through the will to power. It is therefore necessary to justify such traditional forms, which ought to be maintained in such a way that they appear absolutely necessary, as logical and right. And here I must say, private property can only be justified morally and ethically if I assume that human achievements are different. And this thinker also agrees that the masses will drive us to mediocrity without a new master class who feel their superiority. The mass of the working class wants nothing but bread and games. They can never understand the meaning of an ideal, and we cannot hope to win them over to one. What we have to do is select from a new master class. Men who will not allow themselves to be guided, like you, by the morality of pity. Those who rule must know they have the right to rule because they belong to a superior race. So the first of those quotes was from Wilfredo Pareto, far-right economist and sociologist, and often counted as a proto-fascist for his teaching of, influence on, and later support to, Mussolini. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong way up. How are you meant to recognise him like that? Silly me. The second was German proto-fascist thinker Oswald Spengler, a great influence on Hitler. And those last two quotes were, of course, from Adolf Hitler. Massive thanks to David Stocksdale for reading those out. Sorry to lumber you with having to read the Hitler bits. So what am I saying here? Am I saying that Nietzsche was a fascist? No. And even in these quotes, we can detect framings of nationalism and racialization, for example, which do not fit well with some of Nietzsche's ideas on those subjects. 
Nietzsche is not one-to-one -one synonymous with Nazism or fascism. But what I want to point out here is that he's also not in any way diametrically opposed to these movements. Too often, I think, we say Nietzsche is not a Nazi and leave it at that. But at this time, when the far right are once again on the rise across the world, I think it's more important than ever to interrogate this point further. Okay, so Nietzsche wasn't a Nazi. He was opposed to anti-Semitism and to nationalism. But that doesn't mean that the Nazis simply wildly misread him, or that their projects have nothing in common. And I think we can see that in these quotes. While I had different ideas about how to enact it, there is some commonality in the projects of these thinkers, and I think it is worth noting that. As I argued in episodes 4 and 5 of The Dark Side of Liberalism, fascism, along with other horrific doctrines like anarcho-capitalism, emerged from this rightward turn of liberalism in the liberal split, to double down on its economic side at the expense of political rights, democracy, and liberty, which now seem to threaten the status quo. Nietzsche may not be an outright fascist, or strictly a direct liberal. In fact, in some ways, he may be closer to an anarcho-capitalist or a right libertarian, given some of his attitudes to the state, but that's not to say that he fits neatly into any of the main categories of positions in this tradition. But he is clearly on this axis, on this spectrum which shares a project of resolving the contradictions of liberalism's economic and political commitments by dropping the political side to more intensively enforce the economic principles. His prophetic language and millenarian project for achieving this also puts him more in line with a fascist or anarcho-capitalist tendency in this area than just with a traditional conservatism, and his love of cruelty, though aligned with some fascist ideas, would probably not be in line with some ANCAP ideas about non-aggression principles. Effectively, while Nietzsche was not a fascist, he was a very prominent thinker in a philosophical tradition from which fascism emerged as a real-world application. If we want to critically examine what parts of our philosophical canon can give rise to or fuel fascistic movements, I think it's important to look again at Nietzsche in this light, to acknowledge and openly engage with the genuinely dangerous and horrific parts of Nietzsche, rather than just ignoring these elements to focus on his nice spiritual-sounding sections about self-overcoming. Yes, death of the author and all, you can have all the readings you like, but I think by not acknowledging the very real presence of this project in Nietzschean thought, we risk allowing these ideas to penetrate unchecked into the ideas of those who may normally disagree, and allow people to form a more benevolent picture of the Nietzsche behind the philosophy, to see him as a sort of philosophical daddy, a mean one perhaps, but still a monumental philosophical figure whose poetic writings inspire awe. And Nietzsche is very good at subtly slipping these ideas in, in ways which leave you awed by his performative genius, rather than critically evaluating his statements for what they actually say. Which brings me on to the other reason I think it's important to acknowledge this aspect of Nietzsche. But before I get onto that, this video's got a bit long and I didn't really want to make it a two-parter because I didn't think it split that well, so I thought I'd put a little interval here just to play a little bit of music, kindly donated by the way by Newcastle Band of Whippet Means, and give you a chance to go and get a drink or a snack, or just give you an obvious place to pause and come back to it later if you need to have a rest before part two. And if you're not pausing it, or if you're watching the premiere, then you've got about 45 seconds. So, here we go. Part 2. Nietzsche's Rhetorical Techniques and the Modern Right You see, it's not just what Nietzsche says that may be useful to understanding and opposing today's far right, but also how he says it. And at this, I think Nietzsche is a frighteningly successful model, and one which I think we can see reflected in the actions of many speakers and movements on the right today. Nietzsche was a master of writing to encourage the reader to agree with him. That is not to say that he has great arguments as such, but that his ways of presenting his arguments, and himself through them, 
was very effective at convincing people of their wisdom, importance, and divergence from the norm, regardless of whether or not it was there. It is in his presentation that he carries out the tricks which will readers to read on and avoid their criticisms. Aphorism 9. Nietzsche the Libertine. I'm an outsider! Honest! One skill of which Nietzsche was a master was that of presenting himself as an outsider even as he sought to reinforce the status quo. Nietzsche presents himself as an aberration, as the Antichrist, an amoralist, an insurgent against his system. In his most famous work, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which was the next most popular book for German soldiers to take the trenches in World War I after the Bible, so pretty influential, he portrays his view through the figure of Zarathustra, this poetic sage, stepping down from a mountain in a sort of biblical parody and assaulting the outside world of Christian values through his impassioned speeches. This is how Nietzsche portrays himself, as an attack upon the values of the mainstream. However, as we have explored, in fact the mainstream of Nietzsche's time, and today, was a philosophy of capitalism and a liberal framework with which he largely agreed. However, using the values of Christianity to construct the culture of his time as one of mediocre democracy and equality, while ignoring the fact that in both contemporary and historical practice those values had been hollowed out in order to support authoritarianism and the capitalist competition framework, allows him to present his own views, his will to intensify the class system and the status quo, as an attack against it, and as something outside of it. And by associating these Christian values to socialism, he is able to defend the establishment against socialist insurgency while using the aesthetics of the insurgent himself, and thus drawing people to him. One great example of this is when Nietzsche takes up the cause of the criminal. What the criminal lacks is the wilderness, a certain freer and more perilous nature and form of existence in which all that is attack and defense in the instinct of a human comes into its own. His virtues have been excommunicated by society. On the surface, this looks like an argument for the social construction of crime, something many of us on the left would approve of, arguing that it is society, for a large part, that, by its exclusions, creates the criminal. However, we would often see this as a product of class, and a left defence of crime would likely be of the oppressed lashing out at their oppressors. This is categorically not what Nietzsche is defending, quite the opposite, as he tells us elsewhere. Thus the Scarlet Judge says, Why did this criminal murder? He wanted to steal. But I tell you, his soul wanted blood, not booty. He thirsted instead for the joy of the knife, but his simple mind did not understand this madness and it persuaded him otherwise. What is the good of blood? it said. Will you not at least commit theft too, take a revenge? And he hearkened to his simple mind, then he robbed as he murdered. For Nietzsche, the honourable aspect of the will to power repressed by society is the will to do violence, to murder. This, it seems clear, in line with his master morality, acts as an expression of exerting power over those weaker. This is Dionysian crime. Meanwhile, theft is a common, dishonourable motivation. From this we can see that for Nietzsche, the person who steals a loaf of bread for their family, the classic example of justifiable theft, is engaged in a lower, simple form of crime. But the exalted higher form is the person who murders to feel the power of it. This is an elitist notion of crime, where the crime of necessity is deplorable, but crimes of passion and power are heroic. To clarify this and link it to what we've already said about Nietzsche's political essence, as we saw above, Nietzsche had an essentialist view of humans, or more accurately, men, by which he saw master values, these capitalistic and oppressive impulses, as the natural state of humanity and justified this on social Darwinist logic. He feels society's moral pretensions restrict this natural aggression, so for him violence is the expression of this inner drive to overpower, and theft merely a survival instinct, which for Nietzsche is somehow less valuable than the violence he valorises. I suppose, like slave morality, it's just utilitous. It almost goes without saying that this argument does not really play out in our observations of the natural world, where most animals try and avoid the massive risk of direct combat, but this video is long enough without going on a sideline into that. This interpretation of Nietzsche on crime is not an outlier, but has found its way, even on one occasion, into the courts, in the US at least, 
1924, in Chicago, two well-off youths, Richard Loeb, 18, and Nathan Leopold, 19, murdered Robert Franks, 14. They also stole some money from him. The ensuing court case, L slash L, was the inspiration for various works, including Hitchcock's Rope in 1948. But why is this relevant here? Well, Leopold was a keen Nietzsche reader, and seemed to have been encouraged by this to violate the so-called herd morality. The trial took an even more Nietzschean turn, however, when it came to deciding between the two sentences available to Leopold, life in prison or death. Both the prosecutor and defending lawyer argued the case from a Nietzschean perspective, based on this reading of Nietzsche on crime. Thus the defence, Clarence Darrow, also a keen Nietzsche reader, argued that the crime was one of passion and that the point was the murder, and so the defendant should be treated more leniently, while the prosecutor, Robert E. Crow, argued for the death penalty on the basis that the crime was centred on the will to steal and so it was a crime of necessity, which is worse and should be more harshly punished. So we see the prosecution claiming, Money is the motive in this case. All through this case is money, money, money. Blood. In this case, passion and a desire for revenge is swept aside for money. While the defense argued, The state itself, in opening this case, said that it was largely for experience and for a thrill, which it was. Every fact in this case shows that Cash had almost nothing to do with it, except as a factor in the perfect crime. The defense was, in the end, successful, and for his honorable will to murder rather than steal, Leopold was given life, not death. This may sound bizarre and abhorrent, and it is, but it is also a good example of how Nietzsche thought we should interpret crime. Literally, one rule for the rich, and another for the poor. Aphorism 10. Everything you hate is socialism. Adopting the style of an outsider is designed to draw the masses, who are not well served by the system. The solution, of course, to the problems of the masses are the very things that Nietzsche and those like him are teaching them to vilify. Socialism, equality, sharing, all these things that would undermine the power and superiority of the ruling class. However, Nietzsche conceptually replaces the system with these very values which would help the masses out of this predicament, leading them to react against these socialist values and demand the intensification of the very class relations that cause their troubles and announce the solutions to them as a response to their problems. It is no overstatement to say that when first reading Nietzsche, and especially Zarathustra, one can feel an urgent rebellious spirit running through it. But under this radical seeming aesthetic, what we find is the status quo masquerading as rebellion. We can see a similar effect today when many reactionaries try and paint themselves as outsiders. We see professional stockbrokers and business people from the ruling class like Donald Trump or Nigel Farage, or even aristocratic professional politicians such as Boris Johnson, and yes, that is him rugby tackling a child there, trying to paint themselves against the elite as friends of the people against the status quo while pushing policies which merely intensify the class divisions, economic exploitation and authoritarianism of our liberal societies. Equally, we see less embedded figures like Sargon of Akkad and Stefan Molyneux presenting themselves as radical outsiders while, again, promoting the free market capitalist system roughly as we have it. And much like Nietzsche, these people need to construct a fantastical version of the ruling class to make their insurgency against. So, much as Nietzsche used Christianity as a cipher for Marxism, and to characterise the pathologies of our system, and thus place himself on the outside, so the far-right talk of globalists, liberal multiculturalists, and of course, cultural or postmodern neo-Marxists taking over our institutions, allowing them to place their status quo enhancing philosophy again in a seemingly radical position, relative to the mainstream, even though, as we see today, Marxist or left values couldn't be further from the mainstream of how our system operates. This also allows them to paint socialists, Marxists and anarchists even, actual insurgents against the class system whose solutions would actually help solve the problems that people face, as supporters of the status quo and defenders of all the things that people dislike. There is another benefit to Nietzsche of engaging with socialism through the straw man of Christianity, and that is that he never has to engage with any socialist theory directly, whatsoever. As I said above, we can see that when Nietzsche says he is the Antichrist, 
he is also saying that he is the anti-Marx. But does he ever directly engage with the work of Karl Marx to show his intellectual superiority or compare the reasoning of their ideas? Does he ever approach a socialist thinker in good faith? Quite the opposite. He critiques it mostly through this Christian proxy, allowing him to performatively dismiss egalitarian values as a whole with no serious engagement. The use of Christianity as a straw man also helps draw in socialists to agreeing with his position, at least in parts, as many a socialist and anarchist to this day will defend the worth of Nietzsche's work. And I know, I was one of them for a while. I once extolled the virtues of precisely Nietzsche's critique of Christianity, edgy atheist as I was, and had no inkling that I was at the same time endorsing his direct assault on my more deeply held belief in socialism. The use of Christianity is artful because Christianity is so easily hated, and questioning Christianity is an edgy cool thing to do even today when you're young and just starting to play with those sorts of ideas. On top of all this, he also offers some forms of self-help, enticing people to go on a psychological journey of self-overcoming and so forth, offering them a sort of life path which seems cryptically hidden just below the surface of his text, but is full of sacred yeses and wine gods, so it sounds pretty cool. Much like the far right today, Nietzsche hides his power level to draw in those vulnerable to his advances, and groom his potential readers. We can see this same practice in how vulnerable young people are targeted by the right today, in atheist circles, as Nietzsche was doing, but also in dating, coaching and self-help circles on the internet, and through cultural experiences like sci-fi films and games. In this way, we can almost see Nietzsche as a 19th century Jordan Peterson, offering edgy young men intellectually styled self-help with this pretension again of being outsider advice, and of course, an underlying conservative message which is also hidden and often disavowed. And of course, the great result of this rhetoric is that socialism becomes the reason for everything you hate. Socialism is perpetuating Christian values, or today often said to be pushing multiculturalism that allows an influx of foreign religions. Socialism makes women not want to date you. Socialism makes you feel like a victim, but put your shoulders back and tidy your room and you can take your rightful place as an evolutionary inheritor of societal control. If you are as clever as me, you too can become a superman. And these straw men, again, invade any engagement with socialist thought, but allow the speaker to seem like they have artfully dispelled their adversary without engaging it at all. It allows them to seem like a winner easily, and their reader to feel like a winner too. Aphorism 11. Read me to win. This feeling of winning is also something that has been noticed in Nietzsche's style. As Lander notes, Malcolm Bull has described this Dionysian search for maximising your own sensation of power as the option of reading for victory. In his appeals to us, Nietzsche is always inviting this reading of his work. When he tells us of the superiority of the select few men, we are supposed to see ourselves in this. When he says, Every superior human being will instinctively aspire after a secret citadel where he is set free from the crowd. For example, he is not expecting us to identify with the crowd, the socialist masses, but with this select few who Nietzsche is appealing to. He speaks to his reader as though they are, by reading this book, one of the chosen, a free thinker. If we read the other way, if we sympathise with the slaves, the Christians, the socialist masses, we are clearly not of the high caste, not on the path to the Ubermensch or the Dionysian Enlightenment, but weak, pathetic, mediocre beings, stuck in our resentment of the power of others. In short, we are losers. Again, by using his poetic and prophetic style, and taking his enigmatic outsider persona, Nietzsche avoids needing to argue this in a serious philosophical way, or reference or oppose interlocutors who may disagree, or at least ones he has not constructed himself, but can assert it in such a way that we want to believe it. We don't want to be those pathetic, mediocre masses. We can't be the last men. We must be special. Be the chosen. This is taken to the extreme in some of Nietzsche's famously self-aggrandizing chapter headings in Ecce Homo. Why I am so wise. Why I am so clever. Why I write such good books. And why I am destiny. Or in his assertion, now used as the title of a recent biography of him, I am dynamite. Of course, all philosophers write with a certain assurity, and many write as though they are certain of their truth. But in Nietzschean thought, to disagree is to be a failure. As Malcolm Bull puts it, 
Reading like losers will make us feel powerless and vulnerable. The net result, of course, is that reading Nietzsche... Nietzsche? Nietzsche? I've just realised I've only ever seen it written down. Tell you what, I'll do both, although having said that, it's probably actually pronounced Nietzsche or something. The net result, of course, is that reading Nietzsche will be far less pleasurable. Rather than being an exhilarating vision of the limitless possibilities of emancipation, Nietzsche's texts... or Noichi's texts will continually remind us of our weakness and mediocrity, and our irreducible exclusion from the life of joy and careless laughter that is possible only for those who are healthier and more powerful. In this way, even if you would naturally disagree, Nietzsche challenges his readers to accept what he says at face value, or face being weak, stupid, mediocre, the last men. This incitement to personally identify with Nietzsche's ideas by linking your understanding of them to your sense of ego is, I think, one of the reasons he manages to get a pass so often, even from some thinkers who should, on the surface, otherwise radically disagree with him. Reading Nietzsche, you just want to agree with him. But I don't think this is because his work is inherently true, or because it speaks to something fundamental in us. His truisms can only appear that way, because they conform so closely to the status quo, and that is what it speaks to. But trying to use charismatic words like this to get you to accept a harmful status quo is less enlightenment, in my view, and more like philosophical grooming or gaslighting. Again, I think we can see here some commonality with some of the toxic cultures on the right today. The right constantly refer to their interlocutors with slurs that are designed to undermine their strength and power, generally from a masculine perspective. Like cuck, implying that you are sexually submissive or uncontrolling, as if that's a bad thing. Or Snowflake, implying you are unique and breakable and think you are special. Or NPC, which says you are basically not a real person. Just part of the mass of people that the right, as strong individuals, do not need to care about. This sort of posturing and abuse can make it very hard to look from another perspective or question what is being said, for fear that it will make you weak and lead to ridicule or worse. Another example of this in today's world might again be Jordan Peterson, He aims to help his readers feel like winners by tidying their rooms, putting their shoulders back and generally trying to fix small aspects of their life. And on this basis, they don't question the right-wing assumptions about society, gender and so on, which he smuggles underneath all that. Again, using this kind of self-help vibe to facilitate subtle placement of this sort of idea is something that I think Nietzsche and Peterson have in common. Aphorism 12. Nietzsche is not your daddy. When studying philosophers, it's often tempting to take them as grand, patriarchal figures, as metaphorical father or mother figures, taking us down a road to enlightenment. And this is especially strong when we read someone like Nietzsche, who so implores you to see yourself as one of his chosen thinkers, and to see him as someone taking you on that path towards the ubermensch, and thereby to see yourself as separate from the mediocre herd who do not understand the great things that you do. Allowing yourself to think of any figure in this way, be it Marx, Judith Butler, Peter Kropotkin or whoever, is basically a bad idea, but with a thinker like Nietzsche, I think it's especially dangerous. As we have seen, much of his writing really serves to naturalise the status quo through mythic figures and poetic language, while evading any serious engagement with the ideas he critiques. Ideas like his elitist hatred of the masses and egotistical promotion of the self as the one person who knows better than those around him can be a tantalising formula reinforcing some of our worst instincts, especially for those who feel outcast from society, and his right-wing propaganda can be subtle enough to slip by unnoticed, so as to come to impact the thought of even some of the greatest thinkers of the radical tradition, as we saw earlier in Emma Goldman. So what am I saying? Should we consign Nietzsche to the dustbin of history? Is Nietzsche cancelled? Well, no, of course not. Nietzsche's advantage over some of his imitators today, like Jordan Peterson, is that there is the odd, decent idea mixed up in there with all the nonsense. And certainly much great intellectual work references and owes debts to Nietzsche, even if in some cases I may disagree with their reading of him. However, what I am trying to say here is that I think Nietzsche is a philosopher we should handle with care, and whose darker sides should be dealt with openly, because, let's be clear, though he's not a fascist, he's not that far away either. Inside his work, he smuggles many reactionary concepts, poetically packaged to slip past our defences, including anti-democratic thought, anti-feminism, and an opposition to left or socialist projects to improve the lives of the masses. Like many reactionaries today, he generally opposes the social progress of his time, 
often calling it unnatural, and attempts to cement and even intensify the darker parts of his contemporary status quo by arguing that they are natural, in some cases even up to slavery. In this way, while claiming to be a wild outsider or libertine, Nietzsche actually attempts to naturalise the material relations of the status quo and to allow them to endure indefinitely. And in his notions of class and of crime, we see some incredibly dangerous tendencies in his work that could, in the right circumstances, be used to justify all manner of atrocities. And at a time when all manner of atrocities seem to be happening, I think this is also worth noting. By ignoring the imminent threat in some of his work, or discounting it as discontinuous or metaphorical, I think we can avoid engaging not only with the reality of the text, but with its potential influence on ourselves and our ideas, as well as those around us. Nietzsche tries to avoid critical readings by denigrating his detractors as resentful and mediocre. This has to be undermined by pointing out to his readers what it is that he is avoiding. He wants to be read as a mystical self-help type, and not as a political thinker, so the politics can slip underneath. We should not give him that pleasure, but understand how his political meaning underlies and unites all of his text, so that, as Lukacs pointed out in the quote at the start of this essay, all his multiple readings come back to the bourgeoisie's immediate interest. Nietzsche, as a philosophical daddy, is cruel and abusive, and he will groom and gaslight you against your interests. You owe it to yourself to find better role models, for the good of you and those around you. And frankly, when it comes to this, philosophers aren't always the best place to look. A lot of them did some pretty bad shit, or said some dodgy stuff, so maybe idolising philosophers isn't the best idea. So let's not let ourselves fall prey to Nietzsche's elitist incantations, but overcome the bourgeois affectation of intellectual elitism and isolation to stand proud as last men, seeking the true solution of the masses, and loving the masses as ourselves. I say, contrary to Nietzsche, behold the overman. He rules in his world, and all bow to him, as in grey sadness they fulfil his needs, while he sits, combative, paranoid, wary of an attack from another of his order, or from discontents below. The overman says power is great, and blinks. But it is the last person, in that future Nietzsche so despised, who shares their life and joy with those around them as equals, breaking the abusive societal cycles of masters and slaves, who truly overcomes the constraints of our moral genealogy from state and organised religion, and who leads the way to the next phase of humanity, away from capitalism and authority, and who knows true happiness, as do those around them. Now how's that for a prophecy? So thanks for watching everyone. That got a little bit long, didn't it? But thanks for staying to the end if you're here. And I want to say right now, sorry it's taken a long time to get this video out, but it has been a lot of work putting it together, much more than I expected. I don't know if you noticed, but originally this was maybe thought to be something that might come out around Halloween, so a little bit of time taken there. But yeah, I hope it was worth the trouble and that you enjoyed it. And if you did, please like, share and subscribe, or consider supporting me on Patreon. Anyway, I have so many people to thank for helping create this video. I want to first give thanks to all of my fellow creators who gave their voices for the quotes in this video. So massive thanks first to Paul Morin for doing like 10 minutes of Nietzsche quotes, and also to David Stocksdale of Nightmare Masterclass for agreeing to read Hitler, so thanks to him for trusting me to handle that. And huge thanks to Thoughtslime, Mia Mulder, Curio, Bermundalak, Sheep in the Box, Javi from Cunado de Escuelas, Some Random Geek, Ron the Rugged Midwesterner, Chrisiosity, Radical Reviewer, Knotsflix, and Catherine. It's been a great privilege to have you all in the video, and thanks again. And if you haven't heard of any of these people, they all have amazing channels, so go check them out. And also massive thanks as ever to Baphometrics for the music, and to the Whippet Beans for providing the title music. And as ever, thanks to my co-conspirator Blue Agenda for all the amazing work she does to help make these videos as beautiful as they are. Oh, and massive thanks too to all of my friends who loaned me various antique, beautiful, and in some cases valuable items to use as props in my dark academia scene. And of course, I couldn't do this without the amazing support of all the people on Patreon, and thanks for bearing with me while I took ages to complete this video. So, massive thanks to Alex Kostrun, Jigglypuffer, Jonathan Fairfull, Carly, Natty, Peter Benzoni, Revelo, Theo Lane, Zabesian, A Wingless Monkey, Azelia Jane, Baffy and Kit, Becquerel, Brett Long, 
Chai T Rex, Das Martin, Eden Harris, Evil Eric, Flower Boy, Geshtin, James Dirtke, Jason Roger Morgan, Mr. Awesome Be Cool, Rain, Rory, Everybody Talks, Some Random Geek, Thought Slime, Ulrich Volker Anderson, Varg Broder, Way More Oddity, William Calhoun, and William Rowe. Really sorry if I got anyone's name wrong there. And extra special thanks to Liam Moore. So, I think that's about it. See you next time. Bye!